Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Kim. I work with Dr. Lasasso and the PECTIS team. Um, I'm often the uh, first person that you speak to as you, when you reach out to his front office um, and I can help guide you through your initial questions um, about the procedure, about the process, about the logistics. Um, and as many of you know, um, Dr. Lasasso is based out of New Jersey. Um, however, he has patients from all around the US, all around the world. So his practice is set up in a way that uh, accommodates uh, traveling from out of state. So that first step that I would put you in, um, I would pass you along to would be a teleconference with Allison Tan, his PA, um, and then a teleconference with uh, Dr. Lasasso. Um, so I say that just so you know that, you know, this, this is um, an accessible option for everyone because um, the most important thing with Pectus is, is truly choosing the right surgeon. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. This is our fourth webinar of our online series. We've been doing about one a month, um, each with different subtopics of Pectus. Uh, today's one is about nest procedure and sports. Um, and we're thrilled to have six of Dr. Lasasso's former patients and star athletes joining this webinar as well. Um, so we'll kick it off by having Dr. Lasasso um, run through the different dynamics of pectus um, and the NUS procedure with sports and with endurance. And then we'll go into a live Q&A session with both Dr. Lasasso and with those six athletes that we'll be introducing a little bit later on. Um, Feel free to type in your questions in the chat box um, throughout the presentation and we'll get to them at the end. Um, you can ask general questions or if there's um, one of the athletes that, um, for example, plays uh, football and you play football, if you wanna ask them a direct question, you can certainly do that. Um, alternative to the chat box, um, you can use the raise hand feature um, and we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lasasso. Thanks, Kim. And good evening to everyone. I'm coming to you from my home in Edgewater, New Jersey. It's a pleasure having all of you. I wanna thank you all for your interest in the topic that we're presenting this evening. And for those of you who have been joining us throughout this webinar series, I hope this has been educational and helpful to you. And uh, thank you for your interest. Um, this is a very special night for me because I'm going to be able to present uh, to all of you uh, six individuals who I've come to know and love and respect and who are all in their own right heroes. One, because they took on a condition that was challenging to them. They accepted the risk and assumed the responsibility of going through a process that took years to accomplish. And at the same time, they're all exceptional athletes who continue to pursue uh, their passion um, and, uh, and do it while undergoing this therapy. And I think that's such an incredible uh, message that um, I want them to deliver to all of you out there who are athletes and have this condition and who are the parents of athletes uh, and are concerned not only about how to address this uh, individual challenge, uh, but also want their children to continue to pursue uh, something that is of great meaning to each and every one of them. So this is a, um, a primer on uh, how pectus affects individuals in general, um, athletes in particular, um, a little bit about how one has to uh, proceed through the journey to achieve the, the, the best result. And then lastly, to meet these exceptional uh, individuals who I've had the pleasure to help uh, in their life journey. Uh, give you their account of uh, what it meant uh, to undergo the NUS procedure and how it affected them initially through their recovery and how it um, affected their athletic careers. So with that, let's begin. Next slide. 
This is my educational background. I uh, went to medical school at the University of Florida. I did my undergraduate degree at Yale University. I'm boarded in pediatric general surgery and adult general surgery. I trained at, at the Columbia Presbyterian uh, Children's Hospital, then known as Babies Hospital in New York, and then uh, uh, went directly to California where I was the director of the chest wall deformities program at the Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego for uh, over 20 years and had an adult program at the adjacent, adjacent Sharp Memorial Hospital in San Diego. I was trained by Dr. Donald Nuss directly and uh, I, uh, I am forever grateful for his training and mentorship. Next slide. Uh, my uh, Pectus Center of Excellence in San Diego was uh, 20 years and I did over a thousand NUS procedures ranging uh, in uh, ages from 12 to 52. About 20% of my patients were adults. In 2016, uh, four years ago, almost to the day, I moved uh, to the East Coast joining Ranjandir Gandhi and David Friedman. Dr. Gandhi uh, trained me at Columbia Presbyterian and it was uh, a great uh, joy to rejoin him in practice and to bring my program uh, back to where it began in the uh, greater New York area. I operate out of the Valley Hospital, which is in Ridgewood, New Jersey, um, and I operate there uh, on both uh, young adults and adults. Next slide. This is the uh, main entrance to the Valley Hospital, again in Bridgewood, New Jersey. Next slide. This is my team. I'm so blessed uh, to have these wonderful women uh, working with me. Uh, Allison Tan is a uh, physician assistant uh, who is very, very passionate and knowledgeable with regards to uh, pectus uh, and the surgery uh, that uh, is, uh, is done for this condition. And uh, she often will be the first person that you have access to in my practice, uh, where she will talk to you a little bit about uh, what, um, what needs to be done. Um, and then she puts you in touch with me. Kim, you've already met. Uh, Georgia and Linda work within the office doing scheduling and Linda doing uh, much of the heavy lifting when it comes to assisting families with regards to um, the approval process and interfacing with uh, your individual insurance carrier. Next slide. Tonight, I'd like to go over a little bit of a pectus overview. I want all of you uh, to have a basic fund of knowledge to understand what pectus is and how it affects uh, everyone, but in particular athletes. I wanna talk about the physiology of fitness and a little bit about the pathophysiology that's created by the condition of pectus excavatum. I wanna talk um, a bit about the evaluation that each individual with this condition, whether you're a athlete or not, uh, needs to undergo, and then talk a little bit about the post-op recovery. Um, and then I will introduce each of the uh, patient athletes um, give you their bio. Uh, they will then introduce themselves and then we'll proceed with question and answer. Next slide. So basically chest wall deformities, uh, there are very many of them. Uh, we are going to talk about those that are called pectus deformities. Uh, there are three varieties, the most common of which is sunken chest shown on the left. Uh, the next most common is carinatum where your chest protrudes, protrudes. It's sometimes called pigeon breastedness. And then there's a very rare uh, type called arcuatum, which has a little bit of both uh, carinatum or protrusion and excavatum or sunkenness. Um, the thing I want you to understand about the condition is that it's uh, genetically driven that uh, in most uh, individuals, there'll be a family history of the condition and that the genetics of the individual uh, affects the growth of the ribs in the front of the chest adjacent to the breastbone. Um, those ribs are very special. They're made of cartilage like the tip of your nose or your ear. Um, and that cartilage driven by abnormal genetics grows abnormally. 
and it grows abnormally until you stop growing. And it then uh, expresses itself in one of those three types, excavatum, carinatum, or arcuatum. It's the most common chest wall deformity. It's seen in one in every 350 to 500, I'm sorry, 350 to 450 people on the planet. So on any sunny day, on any beach in America, you can probably find someone with their shirt off that has the condition. It affects men more than women, four men to every one woman with the condition. And we've discussed the three types. Next slide. So physiology is a very uh, physiology of fitness is a very complicated subject, and I'm going to you know sort of distill it down to its basics. Essentially, fitness has a lot to do with our genetics. It's a God-given you know um, uh, uh, trait of athletes to have a very high level of proficiency when it comes to fitness, but essentially. It's this dance between your heart and your lungs that allows us to be fit. And the, um, the lungs serve to oxygenate the blood and the heart serves to pump deoxygenated blood, venous blood, from the right side of your heart to the lungs and then back to the left side of your heart where oxygenated blood is distributed to the tissues, which then allow you to perform as a human being and especially as an athlete pursuing aerobically challenging endeavors. Next slide. So now I want to talk about how that physiology is affected by the uh, condition pectus excavatum or sunken chest. As you can see in the diagram, in, a, in the normal anatomy, the heart is situated in the middle of the chest between your breastbone and your thoracic or chest spine, okay? As your chest sinks, the chest is impacted, I'm sorry, the heart is impacted and it's impacted through a very slow process as you grow of the front of the chest pushing downward on the heart and displacing it. So there's literally both compression and displacement depending upon the severity of your individual um, uh, pectus condition. And what that does is it both affects the circulation on the right side of your heart, which is the more anterior side of your heart, and it affects how efficient your heart can pump uh, venous blood to your lungs. And so when there's displacement and, and compression, that side of the circulation is affected and each individual patient then feels symptoms of different severity, which include things like shortness of breath, most commonly, and, and a uh, intolerance of a uh, high level aerobic exercise. So you become fatigued sooner than you would if you didn't have the condition. Also, there can be some, in very severe cases of uh, excavatum, some restriction in lung volume. But the message I wanna deliver to all of you is that this is more a heart or cardiac uh, issue than it is a lung or pulmonary issue. Next slide. So evaluation of this condition when you have it, whether you're an athlete or you are uh, not, is imperative. This is not a cosmetic issue solely. And anyone who says that to you is misinformed. Also, it's extremely important when you have this condition that you are evaluated by experts, people who not only are specialists in heart and lung conditions, but also are people who have experience in dealing specifically with patients with pectus. Uh, starting with a cardiologist with that kind of experience, uh, you will have a full cardiologic evaluation that will include an echocardiogram, which is a sonogram of your heart. And that allows us to look at the valves of your heart 
and also to ensure that the structure of your heart is normal. And we also will screen for a condition called Marfan syndrome and look at the diameter of your aorta, which is the main artery leading from the left side of your heart to your body. In addition, a metabolic stress test needs to be done. And this is important because this stress test is done by special labs in generally academic settings. And it's done in order to really get at that critical question of to what degree is your heart and lungs working inefficiently with one another. And so we measure a, um, uh, uh, a, a physiologic a factor in that um, uh, dance between the heart and the lungs called your oxygen consumption. And when your oxygen consumption is not what it should be, then clearly we've documented that you have this, this um, uh, aberration of your cardiopulmonary physiology. So it's a way of quantifying to what degree your heart and your lungs are just not working as efficiently with one another as they should be. We'll also send you to a pulmonary specialist and he will do uh, an evaluation of lung function, which will rule out other lung conditions, primary lung conditions that might be contributing to the symptoms that you're experiencing. So you need to rule out that you don't have other conditions, the most common of which is asthma, that might be contributing to the problems that you're experiencing. And last but not least, you need to go to someone who can competently image your chest. You need to go to someone who can do MRIs of your chest and your heart and determine to what degree your chest is sunken. That is called your Haller index or severity score. That's, that's um, uh, a simple series of measurements that the radiologist who does the study does for me. And he comes up with a number that will then be, will reflect the severity of your condition. In addition, and this is what's very, very important for all of you to understand, is that you can also at the same time image the circulation of the heart. And in so doing, you have not only an arithmetic severity score, but you also see how the circulation between your heart and your lungs may be affected by the sinking of your chest wall. So those two um, important aspects of imaging coupled with your metabolic stress test can really define anatomically and physiologically um, how your particular uh, chest wall condition is affecting your health. And so it's very important when you um, uh, reach out to uh, people to help you understand about your condition that these kinds of tests and these kinds of specialists are the people who are evaluating you and they are doing these kinds of very important tests. Next slide. So uh, I won't get into the details of the operation, but suffice it to say that someone who does this operation frequently and has a team of people around them, a multidisciplinary team around them, should be the only kind of surgeon who is um, uh, assessing you and treating you, okay? Having, assuming that you've had a, an excellent operation, you, you generally spend three to five days in the hospital. And really during that time, what we're doing is monitoring you and controlling any discomfort or pain that you might be having as a result of the surgical intervention. We've really come a long way in managing the pain associated with the NUS procedure. And we use a multitude of medications uh, attacking the pain sequence, the biochemical pain sequence at various points along the pain pathway. And I think I can say, because I've had 
the experience of 20 years, that this is an area where we've really come a long way in helping patients through this very challenging part of the journey. And what, we, what we're really trying to do uh, by using a multitude of medications is limit the use of narcotics and limiting it not only while you're in the hospital, but in the post-op uh, home setting. Uh, most of us doing this work at a very high level are using narcotics only for up to a week um, in the post-operative period. And after that, it can be managed uh, quite successfully uh, uh, with uh, medicines other than narcotics. As far as getting up and moving, we like to get you up in a chair on the on the second day and walking on the third day and doing both uh, deep breathing and walking for the three weeks uh, following your discharge from the hospital. This is an, a very important period of your recovery. Uh, it doesn't sound to an athlete like walking and deep breathing is much of a workout, but actually it is. And it's important to do something very low impact and be gentle with yourselves and allow yourself to heal. Because what's important here is for the bars to be stable in your chest, healing has to occur. And so during this critical time of healing, it's important to walk, to deep breathe, to do some light stretching, but nothing more strenuous than that. And that's hard for athletes who are coming from a perspective of, you know, a lot of training and a lot of work, both on fitness and on your individual sport. But be kind to yourselves. Take this time to heal and spend this time walking, deep breathing and healing. I'm also a big proponent of early physical therapy. I like to start physical therapy at three weeks I've had the good fortune of working with the lady pictured on, uh, on your screen right now, Kate Grace from San Diego. She has a fantastic physical therapy program uh, in, um, in San Diego. And I was blessed to work with her and wonderful trainers like the gentleman who's pictured there, Victor Valentino, to uh, assist patients in my practice when I was there in uh, achieving uh, a, uh, an optimal period of healing and, and rehabilitation. That takes work. It takes physical therapy. It takes a physical therapy program. So with Kate, I've developed a physical therapy program that can be used by any credible physical therapist anywhere in the world. And that information is on my website and a video showing some of the exercises that athletes and others need to perform during this two to three month period of physical therapy can be found on my website. I encourage you all to go and visit the website and get this information. But there is a physical therapy program available to all of you, and that will be what will launch you back to a point where you can uh, participate in your individual sports. Next slide. What I like to do is bring all of my patients, but, but importantly, my athletes back at three months. That's at the end of the physical therapy part of the journey and, 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 and sort of reconnect with them. Find out how the physical therapy has gone, how they're feeling, how, 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 how strong, how flexible. Uh, and how, how fit they feel at that point. I examine them uh, in the office and we make a joint decision about the way forward. Um, in, in I would say 95% of patients, regardless of sport, they can begin to do sport specific exercising at three months post-op. That's the good news. The not so good news is that you need to give yourself time to get back to a level where you can compete safely, okay? And that has a lot to do with the individual athlete and the individual correction that was done on that particular patient. 
okay? So that's where the pediatric surgeon or surgeon needs to be front and center in helping you uh, assess what your athletic needs and desires are and where you're at in the healing process so that going forward, you can optimally re-engage in your sport without having any kind of setback. But I think in general, you can begin sport-specific exercise at three months and you can return to competitive athletics somewhere in the range of five to six months, depending upon your individual recovery and the sport that you wish to compete in. So that is the didactic session uh, for tonight. Um, I want to now take a moment to introduce each of these exceptional um, individuals who I, I had the pleasure to get to know and work with. Uh, I'll uh, give a brief synopsis of their journey. Uh, I'll introduce them individually, and then we'll go into question and answer. Next slide. So this is Braden, and uh, the pictures tell the story with Braden. He did a lot of growing between the picture on the lower left and the picture of him standing next to me shortly after uh, he completed his, uh, his treatment. Uh, he was diagnosed with uh, pectus excavatum as an infant. You can see how young he was in the, uh, in the picture on the upper left. He was actually scheduled for surgery uh, at around 10. Uh, he was from a different community. He had seen a surgeon there. He thought that he had met the person that he wanted to proceed uh, to, to, to have his surgery with. He came down, saw me in San Diego, he and his parents, and, um, and it, was, uh, it was sort of a bonding experience that I am so glad and I feel so fortunate they, they chose me to, uh, to provide care for them. So I did uh, Braden's surgery at 12. Um, he, has he has excelled at all sports, but his sports include both baseball uh, and basketball. Um, his bars were in for six years. And, and the reason for that is depicted in the middle slide. He did a lot of growing. And as a result, uh, this is important for everyone to know that the uh, bar removal decision is not a decision that is made uh, based on a simple formula. It is made on, um, on a formula of um, three years as the minimum necessary, but being open to allowing the, um, the, the bar to continue to have its effect on the patient when the patient is still significantly growing at the end of that three year interval. So three years is sort of the standard answer for how long uh, the implants should remain in place. But in instances where uh, patients come to me with significant deformities and are very young, then we reserve the, um, uh, the option of leaving the bars in longer. And in Braden's case, it was six years. Uh, he went on to play uh, varsity basketball and baseball, and he did so with his implant in place. He's uh, currently taking a COVID-induced gap year. Uh, he's training uh, for a, uh, uh, an athletic career in baseball uh, at uh, the University of Michigan. I want to wish Braden and his family all the best. I, I want to thank Braden for uh, agreeing to be part of this presentation uh, tonight. And uh, I hope uh, there's a, a few baseball scouts out there uh, and they know that he's already pitching uh, and throwing the ball at 80 miles an hour. So uh, Braden, if you wanna introduce yourself and uh, add anything to that introduction, please do so. Yeah, um, so hi, I'm Braden. Um, so like the bio said, I had the bar in 
uh, when I was 12. It was actually a few days after my 12th birthday. And I remember after the surgery, the plan was, like doc Dr. Lasasa said, that we'd have take the bar out in two to three years. And then after we met, after that time frame, we realized that it just was completely not done growing. And so every six months, I think um, after that, I think I had to grow less than half of it, half an inch, we said, to take the bar out. So then finally, um, I think, yeah, after six years in my uh, second semester of my junior year, I finally grew left, less than half an inch. Um, I'm, I'm 6'10", I, I just kept growing. Um, uh, we had the bar out. And so it was pretty much in my whole athletic career, um, but it really never affected me. I remember I wore for the first few years, like a padded shirt by the scars, um, but it really, nothing, it never stopped me or stopped me from any games or anything. And then had the bar out and had a good senior season. And yeah, now, now I'm deferred. I'm just, I'm training to try to play baseball in college. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Braden. Well, we'll get back to you. Uh, I'm sure yeah. there'll be uh, questions uh, directed uh, to you. Thank you so much. Next slide. So now we go on to Brooke. And uh, Brooke is um, a, uh, uh, came to me at a very, very young age. I, I think I saw her uh, when she was just eight years of age. She grew up surfing and playing baseball and basketball, uh, was a standout setter midfielder for her club soccer team. Uh, but she really, really struggled uh, with her endurance and had uh, shortness of breath. She was engaged in a lot of very, very challenging aerobic activities. And, um, and so she, she definitely uh, was being held back uh, by her deformity. She had her NUS procedure at 11 and literally it was hard holding Brooke back. <laughs> she uh, loves to run, she loves her sports and uh, she was back doing it very, very quickly after she completed her physical therapy. Um, and as she said, she uh, noticed uh, a big change uh, in her performance uh, after having the, uh, the surgery. Uh, she's now a senior in college. She competes at the Division I level in cross country and track and field. Uh, her bar was also in for six years. Uh, again, for much the same reason as Brayden, because she came to me so young and she continued to grow during the period of time that the uh, bar was in place. And um, uh, I think the, uh, it never held her back, but I'll let her fill in the blank on that. Uh, and uh, she was able to go on and uh, compete throughout her high school and now into college. Uh, so I'm, I'm so happy that Brooke has agreed to be part of this, to represent the women in the community with this condition and to represent uh, women athletes uh, with this condition. So uh, Brooke, is there anything you'd like to add and welcome to you? Sure, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, as Dr. West also said, I was diagnosed when I was really young. So I was about eight years old and just kind of, I grew up in San Diego, um, being outdoors and just loving to do anything active um, with my brothers. And I think my parents kind of first recognized um, how Pectus was having an impact on my life when I was playing uh, soccer. I was center midfield and I just loved the game and I would come off the field looking bright red um, from just chasing the ball everywhere. So um, we decided at 11 years old that it was time to have the NUS procedure. And um, I think putting the bar in place was kind of a pretty invasive procedure for 11 year old. But um, I mean, the first time I went back and started running, it was a strange feeling just having a little extra weight, but I became to be something that I never even noticed. Um, and the next year I joined cross country for my middle school team and um, really just immediately saw the benefits that the procedure was having on uh, my athletic performance. Um, and I really just couldn't be more grateful for it. It has had an enormous impact on my life and my 
fondest memories of high school and college are just the practices, games, and all those meets that I spent with teammates. Um, so it was definitely a really positive experience for me. And um, I'm really fortunate enough to have had it. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them and to share my experience with the procedure or competing with the bar in place for so long. Um, maybe, I don't know, the cosmetic effects of the procedure, really anything that comes to mind, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you so much for being uh, here with us tonight and sharing your story. Uh, we'll go on to Cormac. Uh, Cormac was diagnosed uh, at a very young age. He was 13, I think, when he first came to see me. He's also someone who loved running and, uh, and competing in both volleyball and soccer while he was growing up. Um, I think, uh, as I remember it, he was first alerted to the problem when he was going through his timed one mile runs in middle school. And uh, even his coaches noticed that he was uh, having more difficulty than he probably should uh, doing uh, aerobic uh, uh, endeavors. Um, at, at the time, uh, I was living in San Diego, and so Cormac came to me and was evaluated. It was clear that he had a very significant um, degree of pectus, and uh, we proceeded with um, uh, seeking approval uh, for uh, the surgery. And um, that was the first uh, major challenge that we had to confront. Um, uh, his insurance company wasn't in agreement that uh, this was something that uh, was medically indicated. And much to um, my amazement, uh, Cormac's mother and father and family rallied uh, to his side and mine and advocated uh, for um, him to have this operation. And that required even involving uh, the Department of Labor in the state of California. And with great perseverance uh, and strength, um, uh, Cormac's mother was able to get the insurance company to reverse their decision and allowed us to proceed with the operation. Uh, and this, um, this uh, issue of, uh, of advocacy by patients and families in order to achieve uh, approval for the operation, unfortunately is something that still can be challenging uh, today. And it does require uh, the uh, the uh, surgeon, the provider, and the family partnering together to, um, uh, to get uh, approval in some instances from the insurance company to do the surgery that's so, so needed and necessary. Uh, Cormac had his surgery. Uh, it was the summer uh, before his freshman year in high school, so he was roughly uh, 14. Uh, he did his rehabilitation for three months. Um, he is doing great. He had a great career uh, in high school. Um, his, his passion and center of his athletic pursuit has been volleyball. Um, he uh, came to New Jersey uh, recently to have his bar removed, which was a wonderful experience for me to see him and to be there uh, at the end of the journey. Uh, he presently is pay playing for Cal Poly uh, on their uh, varsity uh, volleyball team, which uh, I want a big shout out to Cal Poly and their volleyball team. They were number one in the in the country at the time uh, when uh, the season was cut short. So uh, Cormac, it's a pleasure to have participated in um, in helping you get uh, and overcome this condition. And I'm so happy for you that you're continuing to pursue the sport you're so passionate about. So. Uh, Cormac, would you like to introduce yourself and tell your story? Yeah, Add sure. Thank you. Your story. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm Cormac Williams. I'm a second year at Cal Poly. Um, yeah, probably the biggest uh, hurdle for getting the surgery was not deciding to do the surgery, uh, but definitely the uh, insurance company was a, a big challenge. Um, 
but I mean, we, it was a long battle for sure. And the number of phone calls my mom made to uh, the Department of Labor and everybody who was helping us out, it was, I, I probably couldn't count them at this point. Um, and it was, it was all worth it though. Like I'm Braden, I'm sure you noticed something similar too, but once I got the bar put in and then even more after I got it removed, I just felt so much more mobility in my swing. Um, like pitching and hitting a volleyball are two pretty similar motions. So Braden, I'm sure you noticed a similar thing. Um, but yeah, I would say to anybody who is on the fence about whether or not to get the surgery done, um, I would say definitely do it. It, if anything, it made my athletic performance better. It stopped it from getting worse and in the end made it so much. Yeah. I had to wear a, um, like an Evo shield during the four years, like a protective plate on my chest. Um, and I couldn't dive for the first I want to say a year or a couple of years after the surgery. Um, but that, that was fine. It just made me improve my defense in other ways. Uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm so grateful to Dr. Lasasso and his team for uh, all the ways they helped me out. And yeah. Thank you, Cormac. Thank you very, very much. I'm sure there'll be some uh, volleyball specific questions uh, directed your way later in the program. So thank you again for participating in this. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Right, you bet. Next slide. This is Max, who was diagnosed uh, at 13 years of age. He had his uh, surgery in the winter of his eighth grade year. Uh, Max is a competitive swimmer. And uh, after completing his uh, rehabilitation, he was back in the pool, uh, working out and competing. Um, his bar was in place until the summer of 2015. So he had the typical three-year course uh, with uh, the bars in place. And um, he went on to have a successful um, uh, swimming career uh, as a uh, high school uh, swimmer and went on to swim uh, for the University of Utah's varsity team. So Max, it's great to have you. And uh, uh, anything you'd like to add? Yes, thanks for having me, Dr. Lasasso. Um, as far as um, the kind of time frame you mentioned on the uh, kind of like from surgery to when like swimming again and then competing again, it was pretty spot on. Um, I had, um, I think, slightly longer um, start, like kind of delay until I was um, doing PT again or swimming again. I was doing PT, but then the actual swimming part, I think, was more on the later side. Um, cause there's a lot of kind of psychological stuff of like scared I was going to hurt myself, if I was going to move and I was going to have to have surgery again. And, uh, kind of a lot of parts, um, that played into that there, but, um, once kind of, I got all past that and you were super great and talking through and showing me kind of exercises to help, uh, explore that and take in, uh, you know, ease that uh, fear. Um, but once kind of back training normally, um, I think it was right around just on like the five and like five and a half months dot. Um, I had my first meet back and it was actually kind of a, a best time at the race I did um, that I'd been kind of struggling with for a while prior to surgery. So it was definitely very, very immediate results um, in that regard. Um, and kind of as uh, both the guys previously were mentioning, um, the, the mobility change was, is, was incredible, um, especially with swimming. You have a lot of kind of weird contortions you do with your body sometimes and, uh, you know, expanding and whatnot with certain strokes. Um, it was, it was a very massive help in that field as well. So, uh, yeah, definitely agree with everything you've kind of mentioned as, as far as that. So thanks so much for having me. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Max. I'm sure there's going to be a few swimming related questions for you later. Next slide. This is Sam. Uh, actually Sam, uh, and his family illustrate the genetic component uh, to this. There were other members of of Sam's family who had the condition. Um, he was a, a very gifted athlete, uh, a, a, a letterman in three sports, baseball, uh, football, and basketball uh, during his high school career. Um, he started to notice that he was having difficulty uh, when he was a freshman uh, in, in high school, which is uh, uh, pretty common given that um, 
uh, uh, that's a time of rapid growth for uh, individuals. And as the chest wall grows and grows in this very uh, unique way, uh, symptoms generally start uh, during that period of time. Uh, Sam had his surgery as a sophomore. He was playing football and I remember having conversations with Sam about, well, when can I get back to, you know, playing the game I love and playing football? And, and um, you know, I was, I was a little concerned about, you know, how that would go. I, I was not um, as sure that he would be able to uh, get back to it as quickly as he did, but you know, that's a tribute to Sam and the athlete that he is and his dedication to his sport. And he had two bars and was able to get back to playing football and uh, baseball at a very, very high level. Uh, he rehabbed with great diligence. And uh, by the time he was done with his rehabilitation and his sport specific uh, exercising, he had gained weight and uh, he had a very, very uh, distinguished uh, high school career uh, playing the sports that he loved. So uh, Sam, it's great having you and uh, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, it's great to be here as well. Thank you. Um, so I could not find too many pics of my chest just kind of as I was growing up. Um, so, and as Dr. Lasasa was saying, my father had the chat, uh, um, had practice as well. And uh, so we kind of found it out pretty early with me. Um, but my, it, my chest didn't look too bad as I was growing up. It definitely got worse over time though. Um, but it still, it still didn't look that bad just visually. Um, after Dr. Lasasa went in and I, I had two bars um, after he went in, he told my parents that it looked worse on the inside than on the outside. Um, and that's why I had two bars in instead of one. Um, and so I played freshman football, uh, not too much just because of, I couldn't really do too much without running. It's a, it's a pretty difficult sport to play without uh, just endurance. And um, so I had the surgery sophomore year and then I was going into junior year. I was weighing around like 160 or 170. Didn't play too much, but I was just kind of expecting that. And then senior year, I gained weight and I was the starting tight end. And uh, I had a couple offers from some pretty high up D2 schools, um, but I just chose to go to, I'm now at Boise State University. Um, I just chose to go there just kind of because I liked it. I couldn't really see too many campuses uh, because of COVID. Um, and so right now I'm just kind of training um, and just working out like I'm going to, I'm thinking about playing here, trying to walk on here at Boise State, but so I'm just training to hopefully do that and soon enough, maybe I'll be on the team. So yeah, thank you. Well, I wish that for you, Sam, because I, I, I want to say that the dedication that you put in to, you know, recovering from your surgery and getting back to playing at a very, very high level, a very, very difficult sport with two bars in your chest. It's a tribute to your perseverance and dedication and love of football. So I, uh, I, I just want to say that. I want to say how proud I am of uh, the approach that you took. You were patient when you needed to be patient. I remember how much you wanted to get back and how you know, we, we had to hold you back a little bit early on, but, but uh, I was so happy for you that you were able to get to a point where you could have a, a, a great senior year and enjoy that, the sport that you love. So uh, I think your, your story is a very, very special one. Thanks for being part of it. Yeah, thank you. Next, I, I want to uh, introduce Will. Uh, Will had the surgery in 2015. He had a very, very severe deformity. And uh, he also had a very, very uh, significant passion uh, for surfing. And uh, he's a very, very uh, accomplished surfer and athlete. Uh, he's a professional surfer. 
Uh, he has been featured on the cover of Surfer Magazine. He has multiple titles. And um, when you consider how uh, much of an upper body sport uh, surfing is, to be able to have uh, uh, two bars in place and uh, pursue that sport and continue to uh, achieve within that sport at the very high, high level. It's a tribute to Will, his perseverance uh, and his athleticism. And um, Will is presently uh, uh, training uh, in Bali, in Indonesia. And we were hoping that maybe he could connect with us uh, tonight and who knows, he still may. But I wanted to include Will uh, in this um, group of uh, talented uh, athletes because, uh, you know, his outcome was really exceptional. And given the sport that he pursues, uh, I think it's a tribute to him that he was able to uh, um, uh, train through his recovery and return to the sport that he loves and he excels at a very high level at his sport. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate, uh, who is going to talk through a little bit about the question and answer uh, portion of the evening. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that right now. Hi, everyone. So I noticed that there are already some chat messages. That's great. Um, just a couple of ground rules going forward. Try to keep the questions personal and from being personal, keep them upper level. Um, specific questions regarding insurance might be best handled by the office. And you can always reach out through our website to get any of those questions answered as well. Um, for anybody who's put a message into chat, I'll read through them. But if I don't ask the question or you want more information from more than one athlete or Dr. Lasasso, feel free to unmute yourself and, and continue with your question. Also, if you don't want to ask a question via chat, we can use the raise your hand method and we'll do first come first serve on that. Um, if you're not used to Zoom, the, you can find your raise your hand icon in the bottom of your screen. It's labeled participants. And on the right hand side, if you click on where it says participants, you'll see a little hand and you can click raise your hand and unmute yourself when I, when I call upon you. So either way, raise your hand or via the chat option and we'll go through questions. If, you, if your question isn't answered completely, please feel free to follow up and ask more and you can ask directly or indirectly. So you could say, Sam, I have a question for you or you can ask the group in general and people will take turns answering, including Dr. Lasasso. So on that note, I think we're gonna get started with Nina's question. Uh, Nina had a great question. She asked, is a 19 year old considered a child or an adult for the purpose of the procedure, Dr. Lasasso? Well, you know, I think at 19, you would be considered uh, as still as a, uh, a, a, a pediatric patient. Uh, generally, the uh, cutoff for uh, a, an adult uh, medically is 21. Um, at 19, as a woman, you're no longer growing generally. And so in that instance, in that uh, way, you are more adult-like. Um, but I think at 19, uh, I would say the vast majority of pediatric surgical specialists across the country who uh, do this uh, work at a high level uh, would uh, welcome uh, you uh, into their practice and feel comfortable providing you with care. Nina, did you have any follow-up questions? You also asked if any of the athletes that are here tonight had more than one bar. How many Dr. Lasasso had more than one bar? Uh, I think, uh, I know Sam uh, had uh, more than one bar, and I think Will had uh, more than one bar. Uh, I think everyone else had a single bar. Um, uh, Sam, do you want to talk at all about about uh, uh, 
how how you felt in those three to four months uh, after the surgery? Did you have that sense of a uh, significant pressure? Uh, did you did you have uh, issues that made it difficult for you to get through your rehabilitation? Um, it's always been my feeling that if uh, uh, a person requires two bars and two bars are done in the way that it should be, that uh, there's very little difference uh, from a patient perspective in terms of healing and recovery uh, with one versus two bars. But I would really like uh, uh, a couple of the athletes who had two bars to comment on that. Yeah, um, so I think it was probably as like two bars was as normal as like one. I mean, two bars are in different spots uh, rather than having the one bar. Um, so I think that could make a difference. Uh, when I played football, like junior and senior year, I could kind of feel the bars kind of like among my ribs and my lungs. And uh, I also want to mention, I didn't wear any protective gear during football um, to cover up like the the scars or anything. Um, Molly tells me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, instead of doing that, I just kind of uh, went in the gym a lot and kind of just uh, beefed up my chest and kind of my sides just to kind of give me a little more cushion that way. Um, but so, yeah, um, I don't really think there's probably too much of a difference. I felt fine and I did what I love. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Sam. Let me, let me uh, speak to the protective garment issue. Uh, and, and I think that, that uh, this is, again, something that an individual athlete has to decide for him or herself, whether or not um, you know, they want to do this. But I try to recommend, especially for those of you who are pursuing uh, contact sports, uh, that you wear a protective garment. Uh, there is a company called Evo Shield. I think Cormac mentioned that he had one of their garments and used them during his uh, competitive uh, uh, lifetime. And uh, it's a, a very well-made garment. It has, it's almost like a, a rash guard, for those of you that know what that is, a, a, a very, very tight fitting uh, garment that fits over the chest wall that has padding that is customized to the individual uh, person wearing it and it covers specifically the area where the bar or bars are located. The area that you're most vulnerable uh, is uh, at the end of the bar or bars where the bar is uh, just under the skin. So padding over the sides of the chest wall, uh, I think is extremely helpful, especially for those uh, pursuing a, uh, a contact sport. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. Do you want to comment, Cormac, on yeah. wearing the Evo Shield? Uh, did, it, did it take some getting used to? Do you feel that it, it, it hindered you at any point during the time that you wore it? I mean, yeah, it, as with any, whenever you change something in a sport, it definitely takes a little getting used to, um, uh, especially if it's something that you're wearing. Um, but I would, I would say it didn't really affect me at all once I did get used to it. Um, I mean, the, the thing about the Evo Shield pad itself is it only, for me at least, it only really covered um, like right to, um, not quite all the way around to the sides of my chest where the scars were. Um, so Evo Shield also sells these little like ankle pads uh, that like fit perfectly in that spot uh, where the scars were. So we actually took a couple pieces of an old shirt and um, got pockets tailored on the side uh, that could then fit the ankle pads in those pockets. And then the side uh, where the scars were was uh, protected. Um, so that's, that's, um, that was really helpful, I thought. Great, great. And I, I want to let everyone know that they do have gender specific versions of these uh, uh, of these garments. So for both men and women, they're available. Thanks, Cormac. When, yeah. Question. Uh, 
well, um, just because I oh, saw. Brooke. Yeah, did you did you wear that? Uh, did you wear anything like that when you were playing soccer, Brooke? Yeah, so I had um, the same thing. I got the Evo Shield, um, and I think for me it was more of a mental precaution. I only wore it, I want to say, for the first year or so, um, and then I was uh, like, when I was getting back, and I probably wasn't competing yet, and just practicing. So just getting back on the field, it was nice for me to have. Um, but I definitely agree with Cormac. The one like area where it would give me most discomfort is if I got like an elbow or something to my side um, and the shield didn't really protect that area, but the front of my chest never um, really like experienced direct pain or contact. Yeah, I think that's very powerful information for people who are you know, considering having something done and are participants in very active uh, sports with physical contact, uh, there's a lot of concern, uh, both for the athlete and their families about what, uh, what potential risks might uh, be, um, um, you know, inherent in doing those activities with the NUS bars in place. And uh, I think it's so powerful for all of you to bear witness to the fact that you participated in very active sports that had physical contact as part of it uh, with the bars in place. So hopefully that will reassure both ath athletes and their families that, that this can be done and done safely. Anyone else wanna comment on the psychological aspect uh, that an athlete uh, always has to deal with in terms of their performance, knowing that you had, you know, these bars in your chest. Does anyone want to talk about what the psychological challenge of that was and how you would uh, recommend people who are uh, thinking about the surgery to uh, think about dealing with that aspect. Any, anyone want to answer that? So I kind of mentioned a little bit, I had a lot, I don't say well, a lot, I guess, um, kind of psychological with it. Cause I was swimming, I, swimming into a lot of, you know, kind of twisting and, uh, you know, bending various ways and whatnot in the water. Um, I was pretty regularly borderline terrified for the first like part of the like month I started swimming again in the water, um, just very minimally, just kind of just getting a feel for the water again. Um, my kind of advice to that is it's going to feel weird. There is a, you know, foreign body, foreign, you know, metal bar in your body. It's not normal. Um, it feels weird. It's, you'll be fine. Like it's all, you will be fine. You are like concerned at all. Lasso, Dr. Lasasso and all his team is, they're all amazing. They have, um, he gave me a set of stretches to do kind of beforehand, uh, before I swam to kind of stretch out the chest wall and kind of prevent any, um, kind of tings or, or whatever, you know, various, whatever term you want to use, um, it's kind of unexpected kind of movements just as muscles expanded, um, to kind of prevent any like weird sensations to kind of set my, you know, head and mind a little, or uh, mind at ease a little bit, um, while swimming. So, um. I didn't need the protective gear personally because I you know, swam in the water, it wasn't really a contact sport. Um, but any kind of like psychological worry, um, I'd say trust the system there. And if you do are still concerned, you always read, you know, don't, don't be afraid to ask. We me, me and my parents ask a lot of questions and uh, they're, they're amazing. So yeah, that's, that's my bit on that. That's really well put Max. I, I think it's that personal journey that every athlete has to, sort of, uh, you know, um, go through uh, in dealing with the psychological challenge uh, and that, that, you know, give yourself time, you know, and, and, and get uh, and, and slowly come back to the realization that, hey, I can still do this, you know, yeah. I can still, I can still perform this, you know, uh, activity uh, that I so love and uh, and I'm just going to take it slowly because you know this is this is I, I try to uh, liken it to recovery from a sports injury from an injury that you've incurred through doing the activity and how you have to just take it one step at a time 
uh, give yourself plenty of time uh, to, to heal and to recover, and that slowly you'll get back to a point where you can perform not only at the level that you did before, but hopefully, and in most cases, even better. Did all of you feel, uh, and, and this, is, this is a question that I, I personally have, and I'd like you all to sort of comment on it. Um, was there a point where you felt, my goodness, I'm able to do some things now that I wasn't able to do? And if you had that realization, when along the post-operative journey did it happen for you? Was it six months? Was it a year? Was it two years? Or, 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 or what? Uh, so let, let's go down. Uh, would anyone like to comment on that? I'd like you all to sort of speak to that, that aha moment, if you had it, where you really realized that all of your efforts were paying off and you were actually performing and feeling better performing than you had prior to the surgery. Yeah. I, I Max so. or Cormac, do you want to take that? Here you go, Cormac. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say for, it probably took me a couple years, maybe even three years after uh, the surgery um, to really feel like I was like performing at my peak level. Um, and maybe part of that was just, I hadn't really grown into my body yet. Like uh, I was always super um, lanky and skinny, which was perfect for volleyball, but I still wasn't quite used to being like that yet. But I would say probably towards the end of my junior year, beginning of my senior year was when I really started to grow into myself and be able to um, uh, play at, at a high level. And I feel like even after getting the bar out, that just continued to improve. Um, just again, with the mobility and swing, that, that was a huge difference maker was just being able to open up so much more of my chest um, and just turning when swinging it, it was a huge help. Brooke, would you like to comment on that uh, from the perspective of someone who does something that is I I enormously challenging aerobically? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I'm trying to think of like if there was one specific moment. Um, I think what was really a big influence for me was when I was younger, I kind of just had this daredevil attitude and I had trained so much through running soccer or through playing soccer with the deformity. And I think I, that just helped me gain a lot of fitness um, and made me comfortable with pushing through the discomfort of being tired. Um, so once I had the procedure done um, and I was a little bit more used to what it felt like to run with the bar and I wasn't scared going into the tackles or anything like that for soccer, um, it was mentally really freeing to know that I had all this extra room um, and it kind of helped me I don't know I want to say I like I felt kind of invincible because I knew I was able to perform with this disability or limitation um, and so I was just really excited to be able to compete like without it um, so I don't know I think when I transitioned to starting to run cross country that's when I was able to notice the biggest impact because obviously it's um, like purely aerobic. So I think like there's one race in particular that I look back on and um, just that feeling of competing and running in that race um, was great and reminds me of what a positive impact the surgery had. Wonderful. You know, you all do such different things athletically and I've always been uh, concerned about uh, people who do that, something that is uh, sort of upper body and very repetitive, like, you know, throwing a ball or, um, or swimming. So, uh, Braden, do you want to talk a little bit, especially you as a pitcher, what some of the challenges were um, uh, with, throwing a baseball and having the NUS procedure, uh, was there, was there, did it take you uh, a, a longer time to 
be able to return to actually pitching and throwing. Um, and and what was what was your journey like as a as a baseball pitcher uh, in 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 recovering from the surgery? Mm, um, yeah, so that was definitely the thing that probably took the longest to really get back to normal after the surgery because it is just the repetitive most. It, uh, motion and I think there was definitely a few times where I'd kind of get a little swelling on my right side and I talked to you and it was always fine I'd maybe have to yeah, take I remember it. that I remember that happening periodically to you yeah but um and we had to sort of shut you down a little bit which was always yeah. very very difficult it seemed to mm -hmm. always happen at times when when you were you know getting ready to you know compete in a tournament or something mm -hmm. that was very important to you and so I remember long conversations with you know, uh, with your mom about, you know, you know, what can we do about this? And, and, uh, and so, yes, I remember those intermittent challenges that we had to get through. Yeah. But definitely after I, that was, that was probably for the first, like, yeah, kind of after for like the first year or two, definitely that, that would kind of occur maybe once every few months or something that would pop up. But then after that, when I was able to really build my arm back up and build up strength, it definitely, was just like uh, I felt like I was able to get, get to that next level where I just felt definitely more free and just able to fully have a full range of motion and it was it was a cool experience to have, to have yeah. that. Yeah. Were there were there um, were there pitches that were more problematic for you uh, that you felt the bar more, uh, felt the bar more when you tried to throw it was a breaking ball more difficult than a than just a you know. Uh, a, a, a fastball, so to speak, was it? Was there was there uh, any difference in terms of technique? Uh, so, my my dad didn't let me throw a curveball till I was in uh, ninth or tenth grade, so I don't really know. Like, really, when I had this kind of right up uh, right after the surgery and uh, had kind of these pains, I was really only throwing fastballs, so mm -hmm. I'm not 100 percent sure, but. What, like once once I was throwing curveballs, it really never affected me. But that was also later and uh, later after the talk surgery. About, talk about your 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 pitching career before and after the bar was removed. So you had this period of time because you had the bar in for such a long time. You uh -huh. had a career, a long career with the bar in, and now the bar is gone. Talk, uh -huh. talk a little bit about how that affected your performance before and after. Did you notice a big change after the bar was removed in terms of the mechanics of your pitching motion? Um, I would say it's funny, like, because uh, I because I had I pretty much pitched with it for my whole life. So I, I'd gotten so used to it. So I definitely remember after the surgery, feeling a little more without, without it, a little more free and being able to throw a little harder and uh, have more success, but it, it wasn't really different. Like the bar when I was in didn't, uh, especially after like um, I'd gotten over the hurdles of, you know, sometimes it flaring up, it really didn't affect affect me too much pitching, which was nice. So definitely, definitely a little, but not, not, a, not a crazy amount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Dr. Lasasso. Yes. Okay. Some people have some questions while we're talking to the athlete. Yes, yeah, yeah, Recognizing that everyone has different pain tolerance. Everybody would kind of like to hear which, what each athlete thought about their pain tolerance. What was the level of their pain? Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's go through that. Brooke, do you want to go, we'll go right down the list. We'll give Braden a rest uh, and we'll, we'll get back to him. So why don't we start with Brooke? Brooke, do you want to talk about pain, pain management, how you dealt with it, how big a problem it was for you, et cetera? Sure. Um, so I think for me, the most pain I experienced was the week right after the procedure, um, especially when I was still in the hospital. Um, at Children's Hospital, where I was for that week, they didn't have necessarily the correct, a lot of the nurses didn't have the correct training to deal with um, I guess the pectus, just since it was so unfamiliar to them. Um, and so when they would try to move me around, I think that was a really hard, painful experience, but we ended up finding a nurse who 
said basically to treat um, the pectus surgery like a back surgery. And so then when they were moving me around, I think that made it a lot more comfortable. Um, I also kind of experienced a little bit of the swelling that Brayden experienced, especially on my left side, because that's where the stabilizer was. Um, so I noticed that area getting a little puffy or tender or numb. Um, and so I think the most painful part was like, again, if someone were to hit me there in soccer, um, that would be a little bit painful. Um, and then also just, I also had the bar in for six years. So when I was getting older, the bar obviously didn't grow with me. And so I could kind of just really feel it, um, under my skin and it was, yeah, I was able to kind of like touch around it or feel it. So that those areas were a little more tender. Um, and then last thing that I just thought of, um, just with running and running form again, with the stabilizer being on the left side, I noticed my left shoulder, um, was always really high or my arm would kind of swing out and not my elbow wasn't going straight back. Um, and I didn't notice that motion being something painful that was painful. But as I began, um, pursuing running at, in an athletic career and that I, like a lot of my coaches would point it out to me and, um, just kind of work on my mechanics and try to retrain myself to drive my elbow straight back instead of kind of having it hang out to the side or having the shoulder um, rising up so high. Okay. Thanks, Brooke. Um, Cormac, you want to talk a little bit about your experience with pain and how you managed it? Sure. Um, as far as like during, like in the hospital and post-op, I would say the pain was pretty minimal. I mean, uh, Dr. Lasasso and his team does a very good job of managing that. Um, uh, I, I feel like I'm one of the few men who can say how nice an epidural is. Um, <laughs> but they're, yeah, that, it was nice not really feeling a whole lot of pain while in the hospital and uh, for the first few weeks um, of being home. Um, I, w I had a, a little bit of pain kind of similar to what Braden had uh, like a little bit of swelling, like under the, the right arm. Um, but I, I feel like that, I just stretched that side a lot. Um, so that kind of cured that pretty easily. Um, and then, I mean, as far as pain, I didn't have a whole lot of pain. I feel like it was pretty easy to manage. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Cormac. Max, you want to? Yeah. So I had a slightly different experience. I actually have had probably my, my worst pain um, in the hospital. Um, like I, but I believe that was probably in part to issues with the epidural in the first couple of days. Um, but once that was fixed, the hospital was great. Um, pain in general, um, it wasn't too bad other than the kind of mental, um, you know, imag not necessarily imagining pain, but thinking things are moving around and thinking they were hurting um, when in reality it was just me um, kind of, you know, make your uh, getting in my own head a little bit um pain was pretty once the hospital part was sorted out pain was really um really simple it wasn't too, it wasn't bad there wasn't i didn't get random kind of like stabs of pain ever um it was pretty um it was pretty easy i, I basically forgot about it at, after a certain point um kind of probably within the uh, before the end of the first year it was i you i sometimes forgot it was there um yeah. Okay. Thanks, Max. Sam. Uh, yeah. So for me, pain was always kind of, I think, pretty minimal, uh, even after the hospital. Um, like some stuff would always kind of come up, maybe a couple times a week, and you just kind of got to relax and deal with it. It, I think, I think it kind of sounds just worse than it actually is. Um, and then I also had two. I have scars, and the stabilizers were both on either side. Um, so I think that I may have had like a little less wiggle room to kind of get comfortable. Um, like, I, I don't, I don't really know, but the, I think the hardest points well, for me. I think, were, that's a, that, I think that's a good perception. I think the fact that you had two bars and a stabilizer on either side, you know, really created some feelings for you that, you know, wouldn't have been there uh, in a person with just a single bar and a single stabilizer. 
Yeah, so I feel like I may have had just a little less wiggle room um, than normal. Uh, I think the hardest thing for me was just to like sit up and like I wouldn't, I wasn't even sleeping at my, in my bed at that point. I would just be sleeping on the couch or like a recliner chair. Um, but like I couldn't really like roll out of bed or sit up too easily. It was, that was the, that was for me the most difficult and the most painful part of the whole surgery and then post surgery. How long did that last, Sam? I mean, I know um, it's a long time ago, but how long yeah. do you think that sort of, you know, really having to manage some significant discomfort when you were moving about? Was that was that weeks? Was it months? Um, I think it was probably two two months, one to two months. Um, and then when I started like working out again for uh, to get ready for football, uh, sometimes I would be bench, and uh, it, it would be sometimes. It was kind of weird. I don't know if it was some form issue I kind of had, but I would get like some pain just right where my scars would be. And it would be only kind of with benching or kind of just lifting like front, like your chest, like with the chest muscles, your pecs. Um, it would kind of just be with that. Everything else was, was easy, but it was like, it was just kind of that and setting up for me. Great. Thanks so much. Brayden, I, I don't, I don't recall your, your journey with regards to pain, but I, uh, you know, give, give your, give your insights. Um, similar to Max, I definitely had a decent amount of, pain, decent amount of pain in the hospital. That was definitely when it was uh, at its worst for that first week. And then uh, going back to what I said earlier, anytime I'd kind of get a, a flare up on my right side, it wouldn't necessarily be that, that pain. It, wouldn't, it wasn't that painful. It was just some, some discomfort. And then also similar to what Brooke said, since I also had the bond for so long, kind of towards the end, like the last few months of having it in, I definitely started, again, not really as much pain, but noticing it more kind of on the side and it just feeling a little um, tight or from time to time, but that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, you know, what's interesting is you guys represent sort of the spectrum of how we've managed managed pain because uh, many of you were done uh, in the period where we were using epidurals in the immediate post-operative period. And when your epidural worked, it was the greatest thing in the world. And when your epidural wasn't exactly you know, perfect, then you had more discomfort as a result. We've gone away, we've gone away from using epidurals. Uh, most of us are uh, now uh, doing this operation in, in 2020, uh, have abandoned the epidural and we use other techniques uh, to manage pain in the immediate post-operative period. Um, I have been a big proponent of doing uh, rib blocks uh, intraoperatively using a very powerful local anesthetic uh, to um, that you inject uh, during the operation and and blocking the pain uh, uh, directly by blocking the nerve impulses from the chest wall uh, and and I found that to be very very effective other surgeons use a, 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 a an instrument that freezes the nerve uh, but those kinds of techniques have uh, made the use of the epidural obsolete. And I think that has uh, really been a big um, uh, leap forward in managing that immediate post-operative pain. So you guys represent sort of the history of, uh, of doing the surgery and how we've evolved from the time when some of you had the operation to now. Kate, any other? I have another question for Brooke. Brooke, you mentioned that you had improved lung function. Did your original pulmonary stress test pre-surgery show any compromised function or was it relatively normal? Um, yes, my pulmonary stress test pre-surgery uh, definitely showed abnormalities. Um, I, it was so long ago and I was so young. I don't remember exactly like what it, was wrong with it or the scientific things, but um, I do know that it was significantly abnormal. Yeah, I, I can kind of speak to that a little bit too, because I, I, I don't remember the terms, but I remember the numbers at least. Um, my workup showed um, 
at rest, I had 80% lung function and then at exertion, it was 70. So um, it was definitely noticeable from that after the surgery as well as when that got fixed too. So it's um, from a, from a uh, cardio perspective with swimming. I think that's a great question. I think it points out the fact that you definitely need to have, you know, an adequate, adequate workout by a competent uh, uh, specialist. Um, uh, and that is, it's, it's, it's important to know those values uh, going in because I think it reassures the patient and the family that um, uh, there is truly a documentable um, uh, physiologic issue uh, with regards uh, to the uh, to the anatomy of the chest wall, so so I think that points out that it's so important to be fully evaluated and worked up. Kate, any other questions? Yes. So, Sam, how long was it until you were able to tackle with the bars in? How long did you take off from contact? Um, so junior year was when I played strong safety, so that's defense. Um, it was pretty, it, it wasn't like, it didn't hurt. It was uncomfortable to tackle um, just because you're kind of using just everything in your body um, to do it. Uh, once I kind of, so I, I would probably say like a year is when I was tackling and it, it felt fine. It was a little uncomfortable, but it felt fine. And then when I was just on offense, I was perfectly fine. I didn't even think about it, but that might just be like the adrenaline talking, so. <laughs> Perfect. So Esteban has a question for all of you athletes who lift weights and train. How long after your surgery did you start lifting weights? Can we talk about that? So I personally, I didn't actually start lifting until after the bar was back out. So um, I didn't do like bars specifically. I did a lot of like resistance work though. Um, that we started up pretty quickly actually after PT was over. Um, so then there wasn't any issues with that. But as far as like weights and the kind of, you know, dumbbells and whatnot since um, someone else hopefully can speak to that. Yeah. Um... So I would got in the gym pretty quickly after I did a couple of sessions of uh, physical therapy. And uh, I, I would, I mean, I would go pretty hard, but if there was ever any like soreness or just, I was hurting, I would stop immediately, just go home, ice a bit, just so it would feel a little better. Um, but I would say probably a month or two and then um, so I had the surgery sophomore year when I got into like the end of my junior year, it was super, it, it felt just normal completely. And then senior year, so two years after, I guess, would, uh, felt normal as well. And I, and I think that's a pretty, uh, accurate timeline for most people, especially doing the heavy lifting that, uh, contact athletes need to do. Anyone else want to comment on resistance training, uh, pros and cons? I guess everyone sort of does some degree of resistance training and then you all were able to do that with the bar or bars in place, correct? Is it, it could everyone nod to the, to that? Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Next Here's question. an interesting question, Dr. Lasasso. Did any of you guys have any tips for how you, got a good night's sleep post-surgery. Obviously, immediately after surgery, it was probably more difficult than a couple of years down the road. What was your favorite preferred sleeping position, pillows, et cetera? Lots of pillows. Yeah, First. lots of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, called a wedge pillow you can get. It's like a, a pillow that's in a wedge. So it helps you like lie on your back. Yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent point. Cormac, that you definitely, I think for most of you, uh, the position of comfort, especially post-operatively, is slightly head up, slightly head up, about 30 degrees. Uh, and uh, I also try to emphasize that people should not sleep on their sides uh, for the first three months because all the weight of the body on the end of the bar uh, that's healing can be uh, uh, somewhat uncomfortable. Um, I think someone mentioned having a, uh, a lounge chair. I, I think a, 
uh, a, a lounge chair can allow you to get into a position of comfort very nicely. And many people will actually sleep in it for the first few uh, days to weeks after the surgery. Um, but again, it's that sort of slightly head up position that is most uh, most effective in, in, in getting good rest. Would yeah, you... I had a recliner, I think, for the first short period um, and then moved from there just to on the couch and putting a big back cushion. Um, and then eventually, once I was like walking upstairs and stuff, um, was back in my bed and I think I propped maybe like three pillows behind my head just to be in that inclined position. But um, it definitely was a short like time frame and then um I don't I I don't remember exactly but I definitely not over a few weeks and then I think I was comfortably sleeping and um I mean it really is like a very comfortable surgery and something that I, I mean I had it in for six years and some most of the time didn't even know it was there so um didn't cause too much pain at all great any 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 other questions I've come to the end of my chat list. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to add? Uh, I don't. I don't have a question, but I was just going to mention um, that these webinars are all recorded and saved to our our website. And I just want to thank the the athletes again because it, your impact won't just reach who's on this call right now. Um, people will be accessing this for years to come. And often when I talk to uh, patients, sports is, is definitely one of the top three questions that, that are, they ask about. And so this is something that I'll be able to reference them to. Um, and it, it really, really will have a, a massive impact on, on future patients. So thank you guys so much. It, it really is a huge impact. Thank you all. I mean, you guys really are my heroes. I mean, you were uh, willing to undertake a very, very difficult and arduous, uh, you know, life journey. Um, you did it with great dedication. Um, you guys are really, really a blessing to me. And you're a blessing to the community for sharing your stories uh, with others. So for that, uh, I speak for the entire community and say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for doing this, uh, this webinar with me and uh, sharing your stories. It's gonna mean a lot to a, to a lot of people as Kim said. So thank you all very much. Uh, stay in touch, stay well, and thanks again. Good Before night. you guys go, I'm going to open a poll really quickly and it should take 30 seconds or less. If you could fill it out for us, that would be awesome. So here it goes. Oh, maybe my poll does not have any questions on it. So y'all got off scot-free. <laughs> Never mind. <Keep> up. <laughs> Perfect. Bye. Thanks, guys. Stay well, stay safe. Give my love to your families. Thank you. Thank you, awesome. Thank you guys. Will do, thank you.